Um, and almost from the get-go, I did my first convention in 1989, right in the middle of shooting Night Week. So almost from the get-go, when the movie came out, I've been answering two questions at almost every q and I've done. One is, are we going to see a director's cut of Nightbreed? And the other is, will there be a sequel to Nightbreed? And the answer to that, of course, is that in typical Clive Barker fashion, he originally intended to write three Cabal novels yeah. and make a Nightbreed movie in between each. So there'd be Cabal 1, Nightbreed 1, Cabal 2, Nightbreed 2, Cabal. Now, any of you who know Clive well, knows that you hear that and you disregard it. Because he's, <laughs> he's always working on 102 projects at the same time, but the project that he'll actually do is the 103rd. Um, uh, I think we all know that the, the issue was that uh, Fox decided that Clive was hot from Hellraiser, they were gonna have a, a horror movie come Hell or High Water. And they did their level best to turn a movie that really was, uh, I've always said, is closer to Fellini than anything in mainstream horror. And is really a dark romance, love affair between a girl and a dead guy, rather than straightforwardly a horror film. And they could, you know, we know they couldn't get the basic notion that the monsters were the good guys, etc., etc. In part of this process, I got a phone call from Los Angeles saying, we're going to uh, revoice your character. Uh, what they were really saying, I think, was that we need to redub your lines, and we're not about to fly you from London and put you up in a hotel in Los Angeles when we can hire a voiceover artist in LA for a fraction of the cost. Um, so Lylesberg acquired his German accent, apparently bestowed upon him by some German who's lived in Hong Kong for a long while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, and I continue to answer these questions about the director's cut, and I always increasingly kind of said, I, you know, the sequel is never going to happen. The director's cut, unless somebody in the bowels of Morgan Creek trips over a tin marked Nightbreed, the director's cut. Because Dickie did turn in a director's cut and then refused to, to spoon it, told him to fuck off and went back to England. Clive stayed to firefight. Um, well, Russell has changed all of that. And as near as down it, you are, are now going to get uh, Nightbreed, the movie that Clive intended you to see. Um, I'll leave Russell to say more about that, but um, uh, Lyleberg is going to get his English accent back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually watch, uh, there's, there's something on YouTube <laughs> called Dub Dub, and he's actually uh, dubbing his accent back. <laughs> so he's actually, you, know, you can actually already see it, it's actually the first thing that we did. By February, Russell, Russell bribed me with, a, with a, a, an impossibly huge amount of money to go up to Derby in England to talk to his film students about the Hellraiser movies. While they were watching the film, he hauled me out of the university. We jumped in a taxi, went to a studio, and I quickly redubbed the German lines in English because there's new footage of Lyelsburg, which has my original voice on. So we, we dumped the Germans so it would make it uh, match. Yeah, so, so that's one of the things you might enjoy tonight. Anyway, Chris, over to you. Um, I'm Chris from Corbindale. I played Shuna Sassy. Shuna um, Sassy. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I, I saw the film once or twice, and, um, you know, it, it didn't turn out the way I, I hoped. And I have pretty much come to the end of my dance, physical theater, and acting career and moved on to other things and uh, pretty much forgotten about it. And in, in April, uh, a completely anonymous uh, friend request on Facebook showed up in my inbox. And, you know, I didn't respond for a few days and I thought, well, who is this? Is this someone from England? I've lived in England for 14 years. What's going on here? So I checked him out. He seemed okay. And it turned out that it was someone who knew Russell. And they put us in touch with each other. And long story short, I'm here. So. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah. 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 Tonight will be the first time that Chris has seen the Cabal Cup. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So all I want to say about myself <laughs> is that uh, first and foremost, I, I'm like you, I'm a Clive Barker fan. And luckily enough that I've known him on and off since 1987 and I've been his friend for about 21 years and I, I kind of heard that they discovered a, a work print of Nightbreed two years ago and uh, I, I, I do a lot of things with Clyde's artwork and I have a lot of things with scripts and things and basically uh, I asked a guy called Mark Miller if I could take away a copy of the work print to take a look at and when I went home and watched it I thought that this is kind of a no-brainer this is Nightbreed as it should be seen it, it was terrible to watch because it was only in seven minute chunks like work prints are. So there was lots of leader reels and things and I watched it and I thought, well I'm a filmmaker and I work with an editor so I'm going to have a go at reconstructing this and I spent three months of my life working in my attic three days a week on, on reconstructing it and I took uh, Nightbreed, the film that you will have seen, I took the work print and I took Clive's original first and second draft scripts and I reconstructed it, and I find that I had 97% of what was in the script uh, in that work print. And I then got to the end of it and realised the sound was terrible and had its sound effects, and I brought somebody in to colour correct it, and did lots of work, and, and, and kind of like Doug said, I bribed him to come and dub his voice, and, and I made it, and I kind of made it in, a, in all honesty so I could watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't give a flying beep about you lot or anybody else. I kinda, and then one day it was finished and I took it downstairs and watched it on my plasma TV and it, I had goosebumps on my back because it was a film I'd heard about for 20 years and I was watching it. And then I kind of then made, you know, in this kind of geeky fashion, I made a cover and I printed my DVD and off I went to Los Angeles and took it to Clive's home. And I, and I took it there and I gave a copy of it to him to watch. And then I flew to New Zealand and, to hide. And, <laughs> and basically, three days later, I got an email. Clive, well, first of all, I heard from Clive that he watched it three times in one night and he was in tears and he was blown away and he, and he was what he wanted to watch. And then I got an email from Mark Miller saying, Clive's notes. And if you guys know about Clive Parker, I was like, fuck. <laughs> and I then I opened this email with trepidation and then uh, I opened it and he asked me to make three minuscule little changes, tiny ones, he asked me to move a scene, he asked me to put a piece of sound on something and he asked me to put another piece of sound on the end and uh, wh when I did that, uh, about a month later, Mark Miller got in touch and said, oh there's, there's a place called Mad Monster Party in North Carolina wants to screen Nightbreed. He, and, and he said, we've got something more special than Nightbreed, we've got a new version of it. And we asked permission from Morgan Creek, and they said that we could screen it, and we took it, and we screened it to 500 people. And within three days, there were 7,000 people asking to watch the film. And then, then Occupy Midian started, and I got a screening request almost every single day for a year of people that wanted to watch it. Some people wanted to watch it in their living room, which was kind of silly, and people wanted to watch it at events like this. And we began a journey, and, and we started off, this is the film that you'll watch tonight, is version seven of the Cabal Cup. And, and it won't really be finished until uh, Scream Shout Factory releases next year, where we do the final sound mix and more image restoration, etc. And I'll let Michael, when we get to the end, talk a little bit about that. But, so my journey with this is, is to actually take the film and go into a room uh, uh, full of people that never wanted to watch this movie and watch it. And it's the most rewarding thing are, are your comments afterwards and your questions. So I really look forward to that. So I'll pass you on to Craig and you can, we can talk about it a little more, you know, for what you want for a second. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm Craig, I'm Craig. basically the way I think everybody else did from the new cut. I, I got, you know, 
Matt Russell at the Monster, what was it called? Mad Monster Party. Mad, 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 Mad Monster Party, and we saw the new new uh, cut, which was pretty amazing and fun. And, um, and then I got to go to a screening and see Clive for the first time since we filmed, and uh, that was awesome. He talked to the audience and thrilled everybody with his genius. And, uh, you know, since then we've, we've gone to three or four places and screened and watched the, you know, the response and the, you know, the interest grow. And it's been, it's been very gratifying and really fun and, and fun to revive something that's, you know, 20 years old and, and, uh, and see the director's uh, vision come to life. So, uh, but all I have to say that it's, uh, it's great. It's great to see you all here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nick Vince, and I have played Kinski in Night Read. Thank you. I also played the lead berserker, which is the white-coloured berserker, uh, unless there was flame involved, in which case they put a stunt man in the, you know, as they did when you see Kinski running up the stairs carrying a bit of baffling, not me, stunt man. There were explosions involved. Um, so I played Kinsky in the movies. I then later went on to write for the Blunt <coughs> Breed comic. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. That was so much fun. It was really great. I went, um, yeah, I just realized some of the things I wrote. Um, <laughs> usual question, there aren't any children in the audience, are there? Oh, good, good, good. We did penises last night. We did penises. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so her is necrophilia. Uh, uh, that's good, that's okay. But it involves penises. Tonight is necrophilia night. Yeah, tonight is necrophilia night. Yeah, so um, it was really nice doing that. I, I had my own, uh, I've written for the Hellraiser comic as well, and I've written my own um, series of uh, Martin Warheads, and I've written some other stuff as well. And uh, funny enough, I've done a lot of modelling for comic artists, not hard. Like with John Bolton. <laughs> yeah. John Bolton. He did a wonderful job on my Hellraiser stories along for that. And with Barbie Wilde, who plays this female son of mine, and both models for that, uh, being these some angels for others. I also have a model for a guy called Dave McKean. Um, he had cages. I know, I know, I just thought I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, to, 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 to put it in context. So when I got given the nine big coming, so I phoned up Clyde and I said, so what do you want me to do? Yeah. Um, I've got some ideas and something. He said, well, I'd really like you to start telling the story. Because up until that point, Dan Chichester had introduced an awful lot of new characters that you've not seen in the movie. And Clive just said, I'd really like to see what happened to Kinski and uh, Boo and Laurie and so on. So I had a great deal of fun writing it. Ended up like, just writing four because I cancelled the comic. But uh, a few, yeah, these things happen. So yeah, that was me. And then Russell, yeah, saying uh, the first time I saw the Bible cut was in uh, Russell's living room. He put me on the hospital and said, I'll sit down and I'll watch it. He went and made a very, very nice meal. And uh, I watched the Bible cut. So yeah, handed you the mic Oh, is it? No, I have my own. I have my own. He's armed and dangerous with his own microphone. <laughs> my name's Michael Clemens. I'm here with uh, Morgan Creek Productions. Um, and it's weird because I, I wasn't really under contract with Morgan Creek until... Um, I, it's weird. It's very strange. Mad Monster Party, that's come up a couple of times. It's a, it was a, a new new convention that was coming to Charlotte. A couple of guys in uh, California, Joe Moe and Evan McGar had this crazy idea of coming from California and, and having a, 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 a horror convention in Charlotte. And I wanted to screen, I've got this thing called Ghost Trek. I don't know if y'all ever heard of yeah. it. Whatever, Ghost Trek's my thing. I got, there's one person. <laughs> and if you say, and this, isn't a, this is just an aside, this is very sad, but Gia Alleman from The Bachelor, like who gives a shit, because she was on The Bachelor, but she just hung herself a couple of weeks ago. It was very, very strange, but she was actually in, in the, the new episode that's coming out um, on Dread Central. Uh, uh, she, she's in actually both episodes, but anyway, I've been dealing with that. It's kind of fucked up, but <laughs> anyway. All right, so uh, these guys in Bad Monster, I wanted to screen Ghost Track. The Kenji Report was their first award-winning episode that won Best Comedy at Friday Night Film Fest in Louisville. If y'all have ever been there, that's a great convention. 
uh, and uh, what a screen it, and it was falling on deaf ears. And so I got in this big fight with them, and I'm, I said, listen, you motherfucker, if you guys don't support our local stuff, I'm going to make sure nobody comes to your convention, you California motherfuckers. <laughs> and, and, and they go, no, 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 maybe we can help each other. I said, I said well, I, I consult for Morgan Creek. Um, and he goes, wait a minute, Morgan's Creek, Morgan's, Morgan's Creek. He says, Clive and them, and, and Mark Miller, they want to, they, they have this new cut of the Cabal cut, but they want to, they want to show it, Mad Monster, but it's been, you know, they're not getting any response from Morgan Creek. And I said, dude, that take me a phone call. And so I called Dave Robinson, the then vice president, now president, and I said, listen, we got to let these guys screen this thing. You know, it's got some legs, and I did some research on it, and, and there's some interest in it. All Clive people, they want to see it. And, uh, and so that's how I got involved. It was very strange. And uh, then they ended up, um, uh, a couple of months later, we did, they actually screened the Mad Monster. It, and it was weird because at the time, I had Connor McCall and Abby Miller from Walking Dead, a little zombie girl, and they were doing this makeup exhibition. I didn't even get to go and meet Russell and Mark Miller that were there. And I was the guy that orchestrated them because our things were going on at the very same time. So I kind of had to stay in this room, and they were there, and we, we didn't meet. Well, we, we heard that the specter of Morgan Creek had come to our yeah. attention. <laughs> I can't. I, I, I did speak to Craig, and, 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 and Bobby was there. I did speak to Craig and Bobby. Uh, but anyway, make a long story short, I ended up um, getting under contract uh, with Morgan Creek on the television show because of my contribution turning them on to their own property. It was kind of like they, they forgot, you know, and just really didn't know that anybody cared. You know, and, and, and the thing is, it wasn't really Morgan Creek's fault, the whole editing thing, because it went to 20th Century Fox and they wanted to make it as, you know, in, in, in this, as Russell says, a slasher. And, and yeah, it wasn't really a, a slasher. It was more of a, 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 a fantasy, fantasy love story. Uh, with, you know, people getting eaten. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, I, they signed me under contract, but I was on spec, and so I had to, in order to get something going with the whole project, the television project, somebody had to pick up the cabal cut. Somebody had to do something, and, and nobody was really doing anything. So, I started making phone calls. I started reaching out to people. I, I mean, I first contacted Magnet, <coughs> Uh, and uh, they were interested at, at first, but then, they, I don't know, they were a little pissy. Then, then, then I talked to Draft House Films. You all are a fantastic fest, Alamo Draft House. Yep. Yeah. Woo. I talked to Jim Lee, and Jim Lee introduced me to his COO, uh, Jim Shapiro, and we were very, very close to doing a deal with Draft House Films. And right at the very eve of closing the deal, they said, you know, we're, we're just really not in our real house, what, you, what you guys need to do with this. But I want to introduce you to my friend Cliff McMillan at Shout Factory. And so that was so cool because some people would just say, hey, we don't want it, sorry, we can't, and then that would be it. But they, but he was such a fan, he sent me a picture of Decker, this Decker head that he had. You know, he was such a fan. And so he wasn't just going to let it languish. And he, so he turned this on to Shout Factory, which I frankly didn't even know existed. So that's how it happened. And, and it was just so beautiful because we wanted to make the announcement at Comic Con, and we got the deal done like minutes before Comic Con. And, and, and Martin Miller, who had, uh, and, and, I, you know, and he said, this guy, Martin Miller, Martin Miller is Clive's right hand man. Martin Miller is. Torch carrier for, for, for Clive, if God forbid, if, if, if something wouldn't work, have it on. And they have a new comic called uh, Next Testament. Is it Next Testament? Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Episode 4. Oh, four, four. Yeah. And uh, Mark was at Comic Con, and I'm, I'm texting him. He said, Get over to Shout Factory, and I want you to be there when you make the announcement, et cetera. And so Mark went, and he was there, and they, we, like, we got right under the wire, and we made the announcement that Adrian Barbeau was there, and, and it, it was, it, there was a thousand people there, it was just amazing. The response, uh, I mean, Dread Central, Fangoria, everybody was there to cover it. So that's really cool, and, and I was excited to be 
a part of it, and that's why I'm here. And, and I'm really excited that you guys are here. And it just shows me that that uh, our all of these people, all of their hard work, all, all of everything that they represent, and everything that, that they have done is is not it hasn't been for naught. And thank you all for coming. We're re-releasing the uh, original 25 comics on Boom. Woo! Yeah. Cool. So I mean, the real reason that we're all here is for you guys. So anybody want to ask anybody anything about Nightbreed or the Devout Cup? We'll, we'll stick away from modeling and things like that. But it might happen to <laughs> all doing we'll, we'll, we'll talk about necrophilia, as Doug said. But you know, Nightbreed, anybody want to ask anything of any of us? I've never played Pinhead, okay? <laughs> and the Pinhead's not here, there's no center back. So this lady would like to ask a question. Uh, I actually have this question from you, Craig. Uh, I'm a big special effects person, and of course, one of the stars of this film, one of the things that saved it from being completely you know, lost to the original edition, I mean, was you guys' incredible makeup. Yours was particularly realistic. And that was early on in the days of LaTeX, or at least not as advanced as we are now. It was actually the most difficult thing I've ever done in any film. It was, uh, it, for all of us, I mean, all of us, we would get there at 3 in the morning and there were a lot of makeup. How many would you guys say? 20, 25 maybe? There the were days when, I, I mean, I said this last night, but anyone who was here, there were certainly days when, when around the special effects makeup area, it was absolute, utter, total chaos. There were, I wouldn't know a precise number, I mean, if, if like, I remember it. They, they just kept walking out of the room. Yeah. Yeah. I know, 20 plus. They were just monsters everywhere, you know. And, and just pretty cool that somebody has to turn them into monsters. Absolutely. I mean, do you realize that they take these, because they had a, um, they had class actors with the lines and so on, and they had a whole load of extras that they were making up as well. And uh, so they had pieces, and the lady with fingers sticking out of the chin, you'd see that appearing. That particular piece appear on another character, you know, face, you know, <laughs> somehow, you know, just to give it, a, you know, a, a, a different character and the idea that you had some sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was extraordinary. I mean, speaking personally, I was just delighted I could hear, see, speak. I didn't mind sitting in the chair for five hours um, because you know, there's amazing makeup to go on. But if you turned up there for the day as a visitor, as a friend of Clive's, you normally became a new member of the library. <laughs> yeah. And Christine, what about your makeup? How long did that take? Uh, um, I think it, it, it was between six and eight hours. And I remember Mark Julio and I, you know, we kept trying to, you know, every day we time it. Oh, you know, we, we shaved 10 minutes off this morning. And, uh, but, you know, it would start at something like, 3.30, 4 in the morning. Such a talent. Mark? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mark also did, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, I'm straight back to you. Mark also did uh, the Lions Bird makeup. Mark just recently won an Oscar for his involvement in doing Meryl Streep's yeah. uh, aged makeup as Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, and Mark's actually working on a movie with me and Craig, so he's actually going to be the lead maker of my life on a new Clive Barker movie we're going to make next year. So, <laughs> and he still loves Clive Barker. So, and, and, and to have an Oscar winning makeup artist when you're pitching a film is, is really helpful. <laughs> so, anybody else would like to ask anything else? Sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Well, I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just. Memories of uh, sitting in the chair and uh, trying to find ways I could nap while he was working on me. But you know, <laughs> you know, once the headpiece went on, that was it. I had to sit up straight, and uh, you know, and it, and it just went on from there. And then after a while, and I had to stand, and uh, I was not allowed to lie down during the day. And uh, sitting involved cer certain costume adjustments. Going to the bathroom was really emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but e eating, eating, drink, I, my late, the latex, also I was allergic to latex and didn't know it. I had to like latex burn here on my chest were all attached, which is, you know, you don't know that at the time, you know. 
but also the latex went down on my lips, so yeah. anything I drank had to be, you know, come through a straw. Yeah. Breathing was not easy. You get there three in the, you know, three in the morning, finish makeup at nine, and then you shoot all day. And then the other things that take took another for my particular makeup another two hours to get it off. So you, all of us, all of us were, you know, under I think, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of stress with with that. But in between all that, we had these amazing sets and and amazing people running around in amazing costumes. I just have to say as well, as a fan, I couldn't take my eyes off a certain chassis on on set. Mm. It is the most extraordinary and wonderful makeup design yeah. Yeah. and application for job. So. It's a yeah. 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 But I think the, also the, you know, the shout is you've mentioned Mark, but a real shout out to all the makeup artists. Yeah, so little John, little John, and all, okay, yeah. and all the others. Because we were there at 3 o'clock. They would have been there an hour earlier. Yeah. Oh, and Chris and Cunningham, the makeup yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, after we finished, often they'd have to then carry on working, preparing, painting, casting the pieces for the following yeah. day. But they even made each other into monsters. Into monsters. Yes. And the, the makeup team yeah. are actually yeah. up here. They're the berserkers. Most of the berserkers are actually the makeup team. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 And I make the point as well, you know, you, you, you guys always ask me, particularly in relation to the guy who was in here tonight, how long it takes to get the makeup on. And I tell you, and you're, you're always kind of very impressed on my behalf, and I always make the point, I didn't do anything. I sat on my arse and I did crosswords and I smoked, and, which I did then, and I drank coffee, and I listened to music and I made a nuisance of myself. Yeah. And that was my sum contribution to the make. Yeah, and not much has changed. They work. They, they, they work the whole time. All the time. And they're on their feet. And, and, and at the end of the day, when they've taken our makeups off, which takes an hour to two hours, and we go home, they're tidying up, cleaning up, prepping for the next day. I mean, they are the heroes. And Doug was in the chair next to mine, and, and I knew his makeup was, it was like three or four hours, which just seemed like, right. you know, a, not a pittance compared to the time. <laughs> I remember bitching to it. <laughs> All right, we're going, to, we're going to take another question because it would be great to go over a different subject. So anybody else? Want we, to we've only got about 12 minutes, so let's go ahead and get no, we'll, we'll, we'll go till we go, okay? So then, <laughs> then we'll go. Right, right. Thanks for letting me Just relax. All right, anybody else want to ask a question? The movie is 11.30. Have we done? Go ahead, Russell. Talk like you talk. All right, All right. All right. <laughs> Would you, like, I'm moderating this, so shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who wants to ask a question? Because, like I said, you're the important people. So, anybody? Well, uh, that's question. Wait, well, okay. is there a question? So the light is shining in our eyes. Yeah, don't come forward if you don't yeah. become a <laughs> There's a, yeah, okay, so the, the one thing to answer about that, because most people have seen it here in this room, but it's actually, uh, lots of people say that it's 45 minutes longer than the other version. It, it, actually, it's not. It's 70% different. So you've only actually seen 30% of the film that you'll see tonight if it's the first time you've seen the Kabalka. And most of the new material is in media. So, so you actually see new creatures, you have much more definition on character, like Doug's character is on screen twice as much, you get much more of Boone's love story, you, you basically, uh, you get a much more interesting relationship with Decker, you get more of Kinski and Pelequin, you, you understand actually more about why we sympathize with the Nightbreed now. And you also find out why the human beings are, are, are so fucked up. So the sons of the three are a much more interesting thing now. We see them, you know, and all their bigoted ways and, and why they're going after media. We also know more about uh, the black policeman. We find out more about him. We also learn more about Eigerman. We learn more 
about why the priest wants to destroy the nightbreed. You know, and, and, and fundamentally, I, I have kind of like phrase here. D Doug said lots of really good things in his introduction. Like, it, it, for me, it's gone with the wind with monsters now. <laughs> and, I, and I'm serious about that. When you watch it, when you get to the end of it, you actually get a gone with the wind type sequence to end the film. And that's what Clive intended to be all at the beginning. So if you love monsters as much as all of us, you're going to have a fantastic time. So anybody else want to say anything about that? The, right. I would just say, in, sh in, in short answer to you, I would say yes from both sides of the fence. I think you're going to get more emotional involvement uh, with the breed and with, with the humans. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's why it's called the Cabal Coat and it's not called Nightbreed. Yeah. <laughs> that's the answer to that question. Anybody else would like to add anything at all you'd like to know about Nightbreed? Okay, great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. You've never seen Nightbreed? No, I've never Good seen Nightbreed. Wow. I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you are lucky. I've never seen any or anything. Is there anything oh No, I, I, have you ever read nothing? You've read nothing that you've ever done? Zero. Okay, so, so you should just go into it and, and see the, the beautiful thing about this film now is that it has a wonderful story. And the book, as everybody on this table will, will attest to, is it, a fantastic thing. And, and the film that was released was not a fantastic thing because uh, idiots that did not understand it about uh, the kind of what Clyde was trying to talk about at those times about you know being a gay man in a world that did not understand gay people about you know a bit like everybody that comes to Dragon Con and likes to dress up back then that would have been kind of laughed at. So it, it's all about the kind of persecution of otherness, about being different in society. Uh, but now I think with the, the film Second Coming, 22 years after its release, that we were actually allowed to celebrate its otherness, and I think that that's why it's the perfect time for Nightbreed to have its cabal cup. So I just hope you enjoy it, really. I hope you do. Yeah, gentlemen over there. Hi. Um, yeah, but what do I understand about the otherness? Um, Clyde was very influenced by Peter Christopherson and Coyle and, you know, the, the big underground gay piercing thing that um, sort of influenced Pinhead. Um, what do you guys know about Coyle and uh, what are your thoughts on, um, well, the way that they were censored? Um, censored? Censored, yeah, yeah, they, they did the original soundtrack, the Hellraiser, oh, well. and then it was cut no. down. It wasn't no, 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 the original no, 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 no. They, they, they sent, well, we're talking about Hellraiser, we shouldn't be doing this, but, but in, in brief, they sent some music to Clive, which Clive loved. Um, they weren't censored. The decision was subsequently taken to get Chris Young to write the score for Hellraiser. In my opinion, absolutely the right decision. If you have the Coil soundtrack on it, it would absolutely date the movie. And Chris Young's uh, soundtrack is, is one of the greatest horror film soundtracks written, in my opinion, and it lifts the movie onto a whole other level and makes it completely timeless, but that's how it is. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've got a news flash. Uh, the guy's just been and said that they're not going to start the film till 11.45, so we'll take questions till 11.30 and then we can do pictures for 15 minutes to bring them up. So, so we, we have got plenty of time if anyone wants to ask anything. So yeah, so co coils a whole different kind of fish. I mean, what about do you guys like the Danny Elfman score for Nightbreed? <laughs> but lots of people often ask about the score because the films now a lot longer. And my kind of say that well, I could steal from any Danny Elfman film and it would sound like Nightbreed. <laughs> the only thing I can't put on there is the Simpsons theme. <laughs> But, but, you know, right now he's going to try it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so the, the music is really fundamentally important to film. So the, Clive using Christopher Young and then using Danny Elfman and, and then moving on, you know, using a different composer, you know, for Lord of Illusions, it, it kind of makes the film unique and distinct. So, you know, it, it would be interesting for... 
Has anybody heard that there's a band that have based themselves on my Greek called Gods and Astronaut? Yeah. Yeah, and they, and they kind of make, you know, that ambient music, don't they? Very like Sid Ross and Godspeed to Black Emperor. Yeah, yeah, there's a band. And we've got a screening in Amsterdam, and, and they wanted me to screen the film after they played their set, but we're going to do it the next night. So I'm going to go and watch God is an Astronaut one night, and then we're going to screen night three the night after, so, which will be kind of interesting. So, cool. Anybody want to ask anything else? No, no questions. Right. Yeah, go on. Yeah, come back from behind the pillow. Yeah. yeah, I then want to put it back. Yeah, uh, first, uh, I guess in a long time, we're something new, I'm sure that lots of characters would be in there regardless of their situation at the end of, of the Kabbalah club. So, 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 I mean, that's the kind of, look, the, the, the weird thing is, if you watch Nightbreed and then you watch this, lots, lots of the, the discrepancy between footage is because we don't really, other than one scene, actually use the reshoots. The reshoots really aren't in this film. So, so that, that that's the kind of thing. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. There was a ham-handed segue into apologizing to, for him to say, "Shut the fuck up." Anyway, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, we've been playing the game on, on the television show, and, and the thing is, is, is um, it, it's it's very nebulous right now. Uh, right now, more than Greek. I don't know if you have read that uh, the Exorcist television show is is very close to closing the deal. But I can't say with who and what have you, but it's uh, just all over the internet. Um, and once that happens, then Nightbreed is, is definitely going to be a priority in it as, as far as uh, pushing it um, to get done. But we've, like with Decker, I mean, in the original, in, in the original film, Decker you know, dies and pulls the heart out of the thing and whatever. But, but yeah, I mean, how could you not have Decker? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. That why, why would you? You know what I'm saying? So anyway, and, but in in the Cabal cut, um, I, I can I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you just have to see it. Yeah. There was another question over there. Yeah. That, that was, that was where, where was it? There was one at the back. Jeffrey was backhand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Come forward a little bit yeah. if you don't mind with your sword. Yeah. It's a shame Simon's not here. I was going to say, it's exactly what I was thinking. Because Simon tells a wonderful story about uh, walking out of the premiere. So Simon Bamford, who's in Hellraiser and who's in Nightbreed, he went to the Late premiere. Yeah. yeah, he walked out of the screening of the film and went and got pissed. And then when the film finished, he kind of met Clive on the stairs and told him it was shit and he hated it in front of the studio execs. And the reporters. The reporters, yeah, reporters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they kind of like, Simon and Clive didn't talk to each other for a few years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw the film in the theater. I mean, and I didn't know what I was looking I mean, I, I was thought I was going to see another Hellraiser. I mean, you know, I went when I was 20. I was 23. Yeah, yeah. I was 23. <laughs> so, so from the point of view of you actors, what, what did you all feel when you watched it then? I mean, it's a, it was a wonderful evening. Um, it was great. It was my first West End, and no, only West End premiere uh, in the West End of London, and we had this wonderful party beforehand and sorts of drinks. 
Um, so was a, there were uh, cocktail glasses with little uh, lychee made to look like eyeballs sitting at the bottom of your cocktail drink. <laughs> uh, my family were there, my friends were there, and so on. And, then, and what Clive had said to me uh, beforehand was that he wanted, the, this movie was about being different, being strange, therefore he wanted me to get hold of as many of my friends as possible and invite them to the movie. And anybody I knew in the fetish scene or, um, could, well, I'm the, I can't tell the story. Um, <laughs> it's nothing to do with modeling. Um, it was to, uh, honestly, um, did you ever come with us to Mad and JoJo's? Ah, uh, right. <laughs> so I did. You never know, came to Mad and JoJo's, did you? Take a look at him. No. no. <laughs> So anyway, Madame but I know where of you speak. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't asked Chris if she came. I don't think. No. I wasn't there, but I have been in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the great thing about Madame Jojo's was that, um, and Mr. Clyde was asking to bring some of my friends, um, was that uh, it's a transvestite. Mm -hmm. So the great gag was I took all the straight men that I knew to the transvestite bar and just tried to work out how long it was going to take me to work out where they were, what was going on. <laughs> and uh, there was one girl, um, Sugar, all of them fancied and uh, fancy him and <laughs> flirted with him. It was great, it was great. So, I, I mean, but meanwhile, back, back at the movie, yeah, <laughs> that, those were the people. We always come back to your <laughs> day. <laughs> Sorry, I was just about to, about to say. So back at the movie, there were a lot of people there, and Clive had this real thing about him wanting it to be for people who were not the who were slightly outside society. I can't remember the phrase he used at the time. Fucked up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Deviant. Yeah. Deviant. Yeah. Fun people to know, in other words. Freaks. Yeah. Sorry, you're just saying this and looking at this audience? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with the audience? Nothing's wrong with the audience, that's what I'm saying. Well, what, did, what did you think about when they, you're, they, you're talking about they dealt with your voice? When oh, you, I mean, I, I, I had a phone call as well. They told me who we're going to. I, I had a phone call. Hey, you sounded like that. <laughs> 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 okay. 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 I had no idea what they were doing, but hey, you know. I was watching myself up on this huge, great big screen. You know, it wasn't the West End because it, it, and it wasn't as built up. We actually screened it a second time. Which is what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Like, the great thing was like, last year we went back to the um, Empire of Leicester Square, which is the, the cinema on the other side of the uh, Leicester Square, and saw it again last year. Yeah, it was 1,400 people. It was absolutely amazing. It was the Cabal Fund. And that was the difference between Simon and I was thinking Simon was bluffing. At the end, he was so moved. He was so pleased with it. I was so moved by it. The, the coolest thing is actually you, all the, everybody that was involved in the film, watching it there and seeing it. The first time, special effects people, actors, everybody that was around. Uh, the, I saw Neil Gaiman a week ago, and he took a copy away. He wanted to watch it so much because he actually appears in one of the scenes. So when you when you watch it, there's actually. And Bobby sings a song now in the movie that was supposed yeah. to be in the original. And if you when you watch that sequence, look at the crowd at the front because there's Peter Atkins and Neil Gaiman are the two people at the front of the stage. <laughs> so there's, there are really cool things for you to spot in that film. So anyway, any, anybody else want to ask anything? Gentleman over there, and then we'll go over to the lady. So just maybe you've already answered this, but what was I was surprised to see David Cronenberg as the as the role of Decker, just because you know you don't often see a director and starring in another movie, especially in a role like that. So, what was Clive Barker's you know decision making into bringing him into that role, and what did he think of the Wall Cut? Well, he hasn't watched it yet. Uh, his son Brandon Cronenberg watched it last week, and he he's given uh, a link for his father to watch it. So. I'm waiting to hear from his dad. But if anybody's ever watched David Cronenberg talk on a documentary, he's one cold individual. 
So, I, I, you know, maybe that's something to do with Clive's casting. Doug and Nick or Craig, do you remember anything about his I casting? I meeting him on set. I didn't have any scenes with him. I was just in awe to, to meet the guy. Yeah. Clive had been a huge fan of, of Cronenberg's work from the get-go. Uh, I've gone to see quite a few of Cronenberg's movies with Clive. So I think it was just uh, admiration. And I, as you say, I think also for Clive, there was something of a recognition of Mr. Cronenberg's <laughs> was very, very uh, distinct character and <laughs> wanting to cast him as, uh, as, uh, as Deckard. And Cronenberg is supportive and interested in what's going on with this film. He has said in a couple of interviews that he wants to watch it, which is kind of cool. It's a cool thing for me because you know, I'm a cinephile, I love cinema, so I, you know, to know that somebody like that's going to watch the film. One of the funniest things was we screened the film in LA, Craig, and Clive came, and then I got a message on Facebook the next day from the director of Kung Fu Panda telling me how much he loved this version of the film. Now, how do you think you're going to get you're doing something right or something terrible? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the, it's the weirdest response I've had is the director of Kung Fu Panda coming to tell me this. But, but you get you. Yeah, you, you acted with Chrome Yeah, actually had scenes with Chrome I, I, again, just met him in full makeup. He would have no idea what I looked like. No, no. But, Craig, you did see him. Yeah, what was he like? Yeah, yeah, what was it? I, I actually, I actually ate, ate lunch with him many times. Um, I don't know why, to tell you the truth, after the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was like, you know, I was 29, I was kind of on, you know, spiritually searching for, you know, the answers and God and, you know, what's kind of important. And uh, the first time, you know, I had lunch with me, can you hear me? Yeah. So the, 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 you know, first time I had lunch with the guy in this discussion, he was like, God? So I was like, it was like, you know, okay, well, I guess there's nothing really here to talk about. And he, and, and he truly is, he's just a very steely, seemingly unemotional, cold kind of guy, and is very analytical, very scientific, has absolutely no spiritual depths, which is wonderful, you know? I mean, he writes what he writes, you know? And uh, he's just a very pragmatic, uh, straightforward kind of guy, a very nice guy, and I don't have anything bad to say about him, so Wait a minute, I think Cronenberg is back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, stand up for a second. Yeah. 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 I, I do remember standing in the corridor with Pete Atkins and Pete beckoning me over. Listen at the door. What? Listen at the office door. Now listen, you make me hear a typewriter. Who was writing Naked Lunch? Who was writing Naked Lunch? Wow. Who was writing Naked Lunch? <laughs> 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 so yeah, so anyway, lady over there had a question. Um, well, you know, it was a lady with glasses, wasn't it? Or was it somebody further? Oh, okay. Come on, come forward if you've got a question. We can't see you and we can barely hear you back. Hi, hi. Dancing, just dancing over the telephone. 
the snakes were writh also writhing around my feet, and in between every take or cut, we had to all chip in and chase down those snakes before they <laughs> slithered down. <laughs> and drink. It, you know, and it's like after you know after a few minutes, it's like, well, okay, they're 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 warm and dry, and they're actually very beautiful and not slimy or cold. And, so it became the new normal, but you know, I worked with, ended up working with snakes for several hours. <laughs> I, there is one thing I think I heard us mention about, and um, it kind of went wrong towards the end of film, and it was getting really, really tough, and the uh, producer, um, Gabrielle, yeah. Gabrielle, thank you, Madeleine, um, decided that she was going to cheer Clive up, and she arranged this gag, um, and it was when we were in the um, uh, the barn scene, for those of you who know, and uh, suddenly you just heard, I was walking in my lab, the big one, and I was held on the rear inside. And we all just started dancing to Monster Mash. <laughs> Which is actually probably the great that Clive, I know, just was not happy. He was just, uh, he was too tired, he was just too, just so stressed by that stage. He really was so stressed, but it was a monster to match. It's a great job to match. Have you made a funny story? Besides Cronenberg. Not really. You haven't heard it? Nobody heard it? I always blank. I begin to worry that I'm, I'm, I must be a particularly humorous soul when I'm making a movie because uh, you guys are always asking me about memories of funny moments and I kind of blank on those. My, what, what, I, what I remember most as being entirely awestruck uh, um, to reinstate the word awe a little from its American cousin of awesome <laughs> being, <laughs> being completely uh, awestruck by the sets in particular Baphomet mm. um, and now I'm, I'm a few cuts of the cabal cut behind so I don't know how much more footage of Baphomet you have no, well, I've got a soul that was precious little of it. Yeah, sure. The, there is more stuff of now that we, that's come from very special effects people, but we haven't done anything with it at this stage because okay. we're waiting to do the di the final digital restoration for that sequence. Because yeah. it was just just it's extraordinary to look at and, and <laughs> incredibly beautiful, and again, like nothing you were seeing in, in mainstream horror uh, movies at the time. And also the main set with, with the walkways, which was just um, vast and, and, and very, very uh, exciting. Yeah. And it kind, of, it kind of links to, I mean, I didn't talk about my, my response to seeing the movie for the first time. It, it was disappointment and, and utter frustration because I knew the movie that was there and this was, it didn't make sense. And, and uh, the tribes of the moon embrace you. <laughs> Jawohl! <laughs> you can walk, my children. <laughs> I spent hours because I couldn't lie down or do anything else. So I, you know, I explored the set and the, the caves and the artwork were just incredible. And I saw hardly any of that. And there was this amazing mystery. Um, on the set, they, they just crisscrossing the swinging bridges to the rack and crack that we walked across and ran on and acted on, and that you know burned and fell down. Yeah, it was, yeah you're yeah. right. It's, it's, it's I, I remember having to um, when we played the hand of the um, uh, of the berserker, that yeah. was the lorry back and she goes up, um, having to climb up this scaffold, very tough. And so, and it was a good. Yeah, it was really tall. Um, there were just such huge, huge, huge sets. Amazing set. So, one last question, and then we'll do a few photos and disappear. But yeah, the lady over there that I was pointing out yeah. before. Yeah. The monster at the back. Yeah, we've got the lady against the, the monster. And, yeah, we've got it's a lady with lots of hair. We've got oh, it's a lady over there first. The light. I can't see. So, if you want to start, and then we'll go over. Oh, yeah. And the left under the light. It's the left under the light, yeah. She knows. Yeah. 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 Stand up and shout. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, we, Michael can say something about that. Um, 
presently at uh, Shout Factory, they, we were originally going to try to show the uh, at least a, uh, a, a an early cut at Fantastic Fest. I, I, that's not really going to happen. That's in Austin, Texas, uh, coming up. When is it? September what? No, it's, it's just going to be a walk up. Uh, it's, it's slated for 2014 release. Um, I really can't go into any of the particulars right now, but um, I, I'm I'm thinking maybe summer. But I, I just can't, I, I, I'm I, I'm that's I kind of I, I, I'm not in charge of it anymore. I just made the deal, and the, but I, I promise people are going to be really really happy. I just say that. They, Martin Miller and them are working on a documentary. I know that they're doing that. Um, and uh, have you had any contact you guys? Yeah, 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 doing everybody, yeah, 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 interviewing everybody. But that's a separate thing. That's, that's not for the club. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, it's a separate thing. Yeah, but anyway, um, you, you'll you'll see it. It'll be great. Cool. So, so sometime next year, and there'll be lots of really cool extras for it. I promise. Things from people's archives I've never been seen before. So you'll get a fantastic package. So, okay. All right, good lady over there. Hi again. Hi. <laughs> um, there was a scene where uh, Babette was outside in the sun. Now, she was aware of her condition that if left in the sun, you know, she would debilitate back into sure. yep. her monster form. I, does it explain at all why she was out there? Yeah, that, and that's... And how she got lost in time to just, you know... What, what, what you have that's really important about Babette is the psychic relationship with Laurie. So, so you have another, uh, at that scene where Babette's found outside, and, and, uh, which is how the book is written, okay, you, you then, when, when she rescues her and takes her back to her mother, right, and, and then she has all this interaction with her, you actually get, like I said, about 50% more of Rory and Babette, and you have much more of an understanding about all the things to do with those two characters. So, so the, the, there is an explanation, but you, you don't really find out specifically why she's outside, okay. right? Because that, that wasn't in the novel, so there, there, there was no, I guess it was never explained in, in any of the context that that motivates Laurie to, to you know, meet Babette and the Nightbreed for the first time.